this is a time for us to prove in our own lives the gospel that we've always professed to believe. Um, and just to start the conversation, in the, in the passage that probably is best known to most true Christians in which Jesus gives us teaching about living the Christian life in the Sermon on the Mount, he has a whole section there where he underscores for us that the knowledge of God as our loving, caring, heavenly Father delivers us from two things. One is hypocrisy, that we no, no longer need to pretend to Him to be something that we're not. We no longer need to pretend to anyone else that we're something we're not. But the other thing Jesus uh, underscores is that the knowledge of God as our heavenly Father delivers us from anxiety because we know that no matter what happens, our lives are in His hands, that our lives are secure, as, the, as our fathers used to say. Uh, you know, our, our, our life will never be done until uh, the Lord's numbering of our days is completed. So for ourselves as Christian believers, I think this is what anchors us. Much else in Scripture that anchors us. But this, I think this experience for us which is paralleled for Christians in the past and in, in various seasons, but is for most of us unparalleled, is a challenge to us as to whether we really believe the gospel we have said we believe, whether we trust in the Heavenly Father, actually whether we really know Him as a caring Father. But these things being in place, uh, it's this anchor, or this is one of the anchors, that enables us to minister to others. As Paul says, we are able to comfort others with the comfort that we ourselves have received in Christ. Yeah, I would um, just tack on to what Sinclair said by just noting as an initial comment, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, where Paul says what Jesus says in Matthew 6, do not be anxious but gives a very clear, direct, simple strategy for overcoming the anxieties and worries and fears of life. And that answer is prayer. And so um, it's uh, important during this period that the saints are just stepping up their devotion to spiritual disciplines, being in his word and communing with God in prayer. He bids us to take everything off of our worry list and put it all on our prayer list. He literally says that there's nothing that happens in life that is worth worrying about, but everything is worth praying about. There's nothing too small for God to care about, nothing too big for God to handle. One of the notes of commands to pray is that there are many times promises attached to these commands I think Philippians 4 means so much to me because of the promise attached. The promise attached does not bid that God will change circumstances, even though he is able, as Paul will say in Ephesians 3, to do that, to do beyond what we could ask or think. But he says if we give all of the matters we're tempted to worry about to God in prayer, God will give us peace that surpasses all understanding to guard our hearts and minds. It's not so much uh, divine intervention in the circumstances, it's divine insulation for our hearts and minds so that we're not living lives dominated by worry, doubt, and fear. And of course, at this point in season, we have limited means to have contact with our congregation, but in every opportunity that I have, I'm just, I'm encouraging the saints to pray to the God who hears and knows and cares. It's a good word, HP. We were talking earlier uh, about measures we're both taking and striving to put in place along with the other elders in our churches um, in worship services and uh, all the midweek activities and events being canceled for the time being. You know, this is a complicated matter, and um, I think we tend to, we tend to oversimplify things uh, when it comes to anxieties and worries and cares. Um, the Bible tells us, it doesn't just suggest it to us, but it tells us 
to cast all our cares upon the Lord because He cares for us. So the Bible is, is, is allowing for the reality that we do have cares and that various concerns and anxieties will indeed bubble up in our lives. And we all know people in our lives, friends and family, who are certainly more or less given to anxiety, given to great concern and worry. Even we ourselves, some of us, uh, are more prone to that. This is complicated because you have people that are concerned not only about um, either contracting this virus, people are concerned about spreading this virus, transmitting it to others. They're concerned about their loved ones who are either older or those who are high-risk individuals. They're concerned about uh, their children who have uh, problems with their breathing or lungs and so on. And I was just talking with my brother about that today. So we both have children that could be affected because of their lung problems. A lot of people who weren't concerned maybe two or three weeks ago uh, about the impact of the virus are very concerned about the economic and financial impact, not only to their companies, organizations, schools, and so on, but to their own um, savings and retirements. There are people who are worried that they're not going to have enough money to continue living, uh, continue to have the things that they have worked all their lives for. And so the question that we need to ask, and, and I think one of the things that we need to make sure that we are understanding and, and uh, striving to serve people with is the reality of the worries, the reality of the anxieties, the reality of those fears, and then the question, not do we have them? Because there are people who will say, oh, I don't worry about anything. And often when I talk with people who say that, I realize that they're either being very foolish or they're lying. Because we all have concerns about tomorrow and about the future. The question is, what do we do with those worries? What do we do with those fears? What do we do with those anxieties in our lives? And the question that we need to answer for ourselves and as we strive to lead our friends and our families and our churches is that we don't run to the answers that the world gives us or even the answers that our own flesh might give us, that we run to the Lord with our worries. We go to Him with our anxieties. Too often we, we worry and we fret and we are scared and we don't stop to pray. We don't stop to say, Lord, please help me not to be anxious for anything. And Lord, please help me not to worry about tomorrow, but to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. You know, that, that passage where we are told, cast all your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. I think sometimes we read that or we've memorized that and we've heard it in our lives. And I think sometimes we, we think that means, well, we should try to take care of everything in our lives and handle everything. And only when certain things get out of control or only when we recognize certain things in our lives, we can't really control or we can't really get a hold of. Those are the things and only those things that we go to the Lord with. But we need to always be about the regular pursuit of casting all our cares upon the Lord. And the reason is, it's because He cares for us. He cares for us far beyond what we could even care for ourselves. And that's something I try to remind my children of regularly. As hard as it is, um, that although I love them and I care for them, that their Heavenly Father cares for them far more than I ever could. And that's hard for me to admit, but that's the truth.